So I want to talk about the the concept of possibility. So much of what we talk about in our personal lives and in science and in philosophy takes as an assumption that there is a world of possibility. To, to talk about counterfactuals, things that might have been different, makes sense. To talk about certain things that could have happened, but in fact didn't happen. What gives us license to say that we might have done this event yesterday as opposed to today? And is this necessarily a, a scientifically or philosophically meaningful statement? I guess there, there are two views in philosophy and, and science that seem on their surface to be almost the same. I, they, they have different origins. Uh, so I, I wanted you to, to describe what's called modal realism in, in philosophy. And I wanted to connect that up with this picture of the, the many worlds interpretation of QM and then just talk a little bit about what it means to, to think in terms of possibility. Because yeah. my, my default setting now is that it may not make any sense at all to talk about possibility. That what is actual is in fact all there is and ever is and ever will be. And that possibility is just a fiction that we have spun in our conversation about what is in fact unfolding or seems to be unfolding. So yeah. Bring us to bring us to modal realism and Yeah. Uh, well, um I actually Max would be better about modal realism because no. I think he believes in it. Um and I don't. <laughs> do you, do you use do you use that <laughs> word for it? Well, you're the more of a card carrying philosophy further than I am. We should defend um I could explain quoted, what but, it means, but yeah. But it, it, if you loosely speaking take it to mean that everything that could exist does exist. I find that it's an interesting idea, but it's a little bit too wishy-washy to be really scientifically testable. And um, the, the various uh, theories of physics that give you some kind of multiverse, whether it be distant regions of space that light hasn't reached us from yet, which are predicted by you know, some versions of inflation that gave us a big bang, or, or the ones of quantum mechanics or, or something else, uh, those are more restrictive in a way. It's not like everything I could think about after I had too much wine exists, uh, but rather if you have some particular equations, physics so that have this solution, you know, if they have another solution too, maybe that exists. That's the kind of al alternative realities that these theories tend to give. And, but the shocking thing is that those alternative realities are still, in those cases, very many. And uh, this bothers a lot of people. So... For example, my colleague Alan Guth here at MIT, he, uh, when he and others came up with this inflation theory, which is the most popular mainstream theory of science right now for what caused our, our Big Bang, you know, what it basically says is, yeah, you took something smaller than an atom and it kept doubling its size over and over and over again until it was vastly larger than all the space that we can see, that we mm -hmm. call our universe. And it also predicts that all this other space is also kind of uniformly filled with stuff initially. We know that in this neck of the woods, that stuff, those atoms and so on, gradually coalesced into form, among other places, the Milky Way galaxy, our solar system, and Sam Harris, respect Rebecca Goldstein, and me and you, and here we are, you know. Um, but we know that the probability that this would happen in some random place isn't zero, because it happened here. And inflation typically predicts you actually have an infinite amount of other places with stuff. So if you roll the dice infinitely many times, of course, it's going to happen again. Yeah. And, and uh, the shocking prediction is then that if you go far enough away, you're going to get to another place where there, this identical conversation is taking place. The, yeah. the first one you come to, the, the person wearing the red sweater is not going to be, is going to be named Max Schmegmark and he's going to be speaking some incomprehensible different language, whatever. But if you go far enough, you'll even find someone who speaks English and has the same memories. It's very disturbing uh, notions, but you can't dismiss it just by the saying it sounds too weird, right? right? The way you dismiss it would be to falsify this physics theory, Alan Guth's equations. And there are people building experiments right now to try to falsify it or test it better. And that's how we're ultimately going to sort it out, not by having prejudice about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So the, the philosopher who was um, argued very strongly for modal realism was David Lewis. Yeah. Um, and 
Did did you know him? Did you? Yeah, you no. When I was a graduate student at Princeton, uh-huh. he was yeah, he was actually on my dissertation committee. Hmm. Um, and um, yeah. I won't pry any further then. Well, maybe I will pry. Yeah, was, yeah he's a very well, sweet yeah. man. He's <laughs> a, good, a very sweet man. I heard. Man. I, I, I never met him, but I, yeah, he, he was, was supposed fr- to be very smart. He was a formidable philosopher yeah. and a very sweet man. Um, I'm actually have a me- very strong mental image right now of he had a train set in his basement. Um, and he would only take people he liked very much down there. Uh-huh. And I did get to go down there once. And you were he, train set material. And it was. <laughs> that sounds kind of sketchy when a professor says, hey, do you want to come down to my basement? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, you really stole the thunder from this David Lewis story. No, no, no. <laughs> we, can, we can edit that out. All, yeah. We'll edit the thunder back in. <laughs> but anyway, he, when he when he was running the train set, he put on this little engineering cap, and it was just the cutest uh-huh. thing I ever saw. Right, but uh, but yes, he took you know very very seriously. Well, he had a way. You you ask, is it meaningful to talk about you know had um, you know had I not gone to college, then I would not now be a philosopher or something. You know, what are the truth conditions of that? I right. mean, how do you figure that out? Um, and the way he did it was by reifying possible worlds and saying, you know, that there are a whole bunch of possible worlds and they really exist. And you go to the nearest possible world in which I didn't go to college and you check it out. You know, we can check it out. But what would make it true right. is if that antecedent, you know, um, were true would I not be a philosopher, right? Or, you know, if I didn't go to college and I wasn't a philosopher, then I'd be a millionaire now or something. And you go to the nearest right. um, possible world. So he really, he really took possible worlds very, very seriously in order to formulate what he took to be the truth conditions right. for, but, 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 and the, for again, uh, the motiva- counterfactuals. The, he got there for none of these probability no. reasons that, that Max just... No, it was about, it was, you know, counterfactuals make sense, right? We understand them. You know, if I, you know, if you hadn't called me right then, I, you know, would have missed the most important phone call of my life or something. You know, we'd say these things all the time and we, and they seem meaningful. Mm. How, what are the truth conditions? And he thought that the only way to do it was to say that all these various possible worlds in some sense really exist. And, um, you know, so when I didn't get hit by that truck this morning, um, which was a very near miss, I, there is a counterpart in a very close possible world of me who did get yeah, hit, right. who did get killed. Yeah. So um, It is funny that it is strangely just, convergent with the, the many worlds interpretation. Yeah, it because, is. Yeah. It is, and I, I reflect a lot about that because I was almost hit, killed by a truck when I was going biking to school one day, and I often wonder, you know, is there another, was there another copy of me that ended up in the morgue there? Uh, but I, whether it seems weird or not to me depends very much on what your philosophical starting point is. Because if you start with the attitude that this is it, the solar system, maybe a little more stuff, it seems really weird that there would be faraway places. But if you start instead by just letting go of our egos, you buy into this external reality hypothesis that there is a reality that exists, some, some kind of physical reality independent of us. You know, it has some size. Maybe it's infinite, maybe it's huge, maybe it's tiny, whatever. Here it is. And then you put yourself into this somewhere and ask how much of this whole reality can we humans actually have any access to, any information about? Then there are two possibilities. Either we're going to have access to all of it or we're not. Which way is it? Well, both sound perfectly plausible if you talk about it this way, right? Hmm. It would seem really pretty weird having this sort of omnivision assumption that there's some sort of law of, of nature that says that every conscious being has to be able to see their enti- the entire reality that they're in, right? That sounds exactly like the ostrich with its head in the sand. So as soon as you open to the idea that there can be places in this reality where you can have a conscious being that's not aware of the whole thing, well, boom, there you have your parallel universes. There are other regions which exist. That was our starting point. And our well, beings just have no access to them. And they're going to be, some, of, some people who live there are undoubtedly going to claim that they don't exist. And it's all philosophy. 
But then there will probably be other beings elsewhere who will say that those curmudgeons don't exist. And, yeah, it yeah. just it gets especially strange and strangely parochial when you imagine that all of those parallel universes are populated by people exactly like us or with slight differences to the the you know the thread count in their clothing universe after universe after universe that and that, of course that must be true not only of us but of our pets and all the the, the rodents just, under our houses and I mean, it's, <laughs> you can it's, you uh, can make these arguments yeah. i'm very um hmm, i'm allergic to to theses that you can sort of argue but you can't really believe them but you kind of can maybe that's what's so cool because you know, the, the, these things, they sound super philosophical, and I have been told to only discuss them in bars, and, but I will discuss them anyway, even though this <laughs> is just you. water. In uh, this universe. Know, in this universe. Yeah. Now we actually have gone from arguing about them in bars to arguing about them in physics conferences. And yeah. the reason for this is because it's become clear that there are some experiments that we can do and are trying to do now in the next decade, which will either kill maybe some of these theories or make us take them really seriously, like... People are spending many millions of dollars trying to build quantum computers. If that fails, because the fundamental master key of quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation, is violated, then poof, forget about those quantum parallel worlds. If they work, then we have reason to take it much more seriously. Same yeah. thing with this inflation theory, you know. Yeah, it makes some predictions we can't test, like that there's another Sam Harris with a different thread count on his jacket somewhere. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it makes other predictions also that we can test. We've tested a whole bunch of them by carefully photographing baby pictures of our universe from 13.8 billion years ago, and it's passed all the tests so far. But there are some more tests you know, we're trying to do now. That's, to me, why this is so exciting. Not just because it involves you know, philosophically weird or fun ideas, depending on whether you love them or hate them, but, but because there are actual experiments we can do now, soon, you know, which will teach us more about whether we should take this seriously or not. 